This is Twit. All right, let's go into the brown liquor pick and uh, the rest of the story. Uh, we are at the end of the story, Mika. You get to be part of this, which is, mm. you know, we've gone through growing barley, mulching it, grinding it, washing it to extract its sugars, fermenting it, uh, distilling it in multiple stages. Then we put it into barrels. We are in the stage we call finishing, which begs this question. You know, you've put this clear solvent uh, this alcohol into these oak barrels. When is it ready? Right. You know, it's not. It's not an obvious question. Like when? What is ready now? According to the rules for Scottish whiskey, it must be barley. It must and barley and water are the only ingredients, and it has to have been placed in an oak cask for a minimum of three years before you can call it Scottish whiskey. Now you'll never find a three-year-old Scottish whiskey because they're really not that good. Uh, I think the youngest I've ever seen, the, young, the smallest number I've ever seen on a bottle, and that bottle is always the youngest thing that's in the bottle. Uh, there's often older things than that in the bottle, is an eight. There's a few eights out there. You'll occasionally see a 10, like the Ardbeg makes a 10. Um, 12 is far more common, right? But then it's a long time to be in barrels. And they're not always the same barrels. They may move them around a bit. But there is this question of when when is a barrel ready? And, I mean, and when I, I had a chance to go walking through barrel rooms with master distillers, and you asked him that question, like, when's it ready? And he says, mm, when it tastes good? Mm, that's sure. a good answer, you know? Um, the main thing to think is that, uh, and, and we talked about this in the last episode, when, when we put it in the barrel, we typically put it in at about 63.5% ABV. And it's important to remember that the other 36.5% is primarily water. You know, that's that's why it's only 63% alcohol. The rest is, is water and it's spent time in the barrel pulling some flavors out of the wood, both alcohol solvent flavors and water solvent flavors. And so we lose a certain amount of water and a certain amount of alcohol every year as it sits in a barrel. And there are hundreds and hundreds of barrels in these rick houses and, and racks and so forth. Um, when I've walked around with a master distiller, they're actually tapping the barrels to see where the, li the liquid level is. Like they know the level so well, they can see the rate of loss. They, it, it'll actually stop and go, that's too low. I bet you that barrel's leaking. And then go all around it and find a little crack somewhere. But you are talking hundreds of barrels, right? I mean, just because you've got a you know a set that's, that's going to be twelve years old, so it means you also have a set that are eleven years old, and a set that are ten years old, and so on down the line. And it takes hundreds, and hundreds of barrels for production. But let's talk about the simplest form of finishing. Let's talk about a single casking. Now these are relatively rare. They didn't used to be. Uh, they used to be that that whiskeys that were sold by the cask. There wasn't a bottling process go back 100 or so years. Bottling kind of came along later. Glass is expensive and it's a complicated process. But back in the day, and this still happens occasionally, and if you've got enough money and you want to spend it on whiskey, you can go to a major distillery and essentially buy a cask. And they'll let you come and visit your cask periodically. <laughs> uh, now... These casts are bung. They have a little thing in the center of them that are typically made of silicon, and they'll pop the bung out, and they'll thief from the barrel. And this is a normal part of the process every couple of years for any given for a few of the barrels, depending on where they're located. So they'll take a glass tube, and they'll put it into the barrel, and they'll draw a little whiskey from it, and they'll measure the ABV. So they'll check, like, what's the alcohol level? They've re they write this all in chalk on the side of the barrel. So each time it's thiefed, each time the ABV was measured where it was at, um, what the approximate level is, they have level checks for them as well. And sometimes the distiller will make notes on flavor. Every barrel is a little bit different. It came from a different tree. It's been used a different number of times. Uh, it's been through different weather. All of these factors apply in creating a flavor of whiskey. But And sometimes you'll get a, a nicely rounded barrel. Like it'll, it'll just produce a set of flavors that are really great. And that might become a single cask. And when I've talked to Master Stills about that, they've talked about tasting several hundred barrels to find one or two worthy of a single casking. And depending on the kind of barrel, uh, that's only going to be a few hundred bottles. You know, a hogshead, the typical bourbon barrel remade for, for whiskey purposes is about, can produce about 200 bottles. Like if you're talking about, like take a typical single casking would be maybe 15 years old. So it went in the barrel at 
And 15 years on now, it tastes great. It's down to maybe 56, 57% alcohol. Uh, and so, okay, we're going to pull this from the racks and we're going to, we're going to send it off to bottling now and pull it from the racks. It's, it's got, you know, several hundred liters of liquid in it. It's heavy. You'll, you'll probably need some help. And especially if that's a, ho a hogshead, if it's a punchy on like one of the sherry casts that will hold 600 bottles, you're not moving that. So, but you'll, you'll pull it, you'll send it off for bottling on its own. But that's the exception. That's just not a thing that normally happens. And it is, it's a snobby way to drink whiskey, to drink single casks. Like you can do that. Um, remember, if there's only going to be 200 bottles of this, whiskey's mostly priced by its rarity. And so when there's only 200, you're going to pay a big premium. That's going to be at least a four digit number most of the time yeah. uh, for that kind of whiskey. There are exceptions, but not usually. Far more common are combining barrels to get to a flavor profile. And this is this is the modern whiskey way. So for the last 60, 70 years, really Glenfiddich pioneered this technique. They found a way to make a whiskey taste like the whiskey you expect, like the miracle of a Macallan 12. Is it a taste like Macallan 12 every year? I mean, how? How is that ever possible? They make thousands and thousands of bottles of this. Why does it have a particular taste that enough that you will prefer that brand and continue to spend on that whiskey? And this is the talent that master distillers have is that they are, they know the flavor profile destination they're trying to get to. And remember that when you buy a bottle of Macallan 12, it's only 40%, 6% alcohol. So they're tasting it at a, pieces of it at a much higher alcohol level, which is challenging on its own. And then they're also grabbing the elements of those flavors one piece at a time. A typical bottling run of something like a Macallan 12 is going to involve between 150 and 300 casks, the youngest of which will be the 12-year-olds, because that's why they want to be able to put a 12 on it. They can only, the youngest thing in that bottle is going to be a 12. So they're going to pull barrels. They're going to try and get all the flavors from their 12-year-old. And then they're going to decide what they're missing and maybe pull a couple of olders to add into the mix to get to the flavor profile they're looking for. And when I've been in in the sample rooms where they've pulled, they've thiefed a bunch of, bo uh, of barrels, they'll bring them all back into the room and they have reference bottles, hundreds and hundreds of reference bottles of different past barrels that were part of a given mix for a given edition. I mean, it sounds like it's fun, but it's just like working in a chocolate factory. Eventually, you're sick of chocolate, right? Like these people do. No, it sounds love it, their whiskey. It sounds hard. <laughs> it's actually, very hard, and it's an extraordinary. Because it's not automated. This is literally no. people tasting something to get yes. to the exact. And, and by people, you really mean one or two yeah. in the entire distillery. Like there are only a handful of master distillers. They all kind of know each other. It's a it's a pretty closed club, and they're assembling. A flavor, essentially, for every addition that they make. Now, most distilleries don't have their own bottling facility. A bottling facility is an incredibly elaborate, uh, huge piece of machinery. But Glenfiddich has their own. But Glenfiddich makes a lot of whiskey, and they've been doing it for a very long time. But most of the time, you have large bottling plants. So you got to think about everything that goes into bottling. Like if, literally from, the, they're going to start with casks being shipped to a, to the building. And on the other end, it's going to come out pallets of wrapped boxes of bottled whiskey labeled with export permits and all of those things. And so in between, there are many, many steps. So when 150 barrels show up from a given distiller for a given addition, this is going to be essentially a bottling. They're rolled off, they're brought off the truck and they're rolled into the trough set. So these are warehouse-like looking rooms, but they have troughs running down them that are very clean. They've cleaned out and are sterile and they place the barrels over top of them. Each bung is removed. The barrel is first is measured uh, to see how much exactly how much liquid is in it and then added to the tally. And then they're dumped. They're dumped into the trough. Um, especially with bourbon barrels, the ex-American barrels, you'll see bits of charcoal and things come out of the barrel as well. So often when you see this, you'll see all of this debris in the trough, which looks shocking, but it's it's literally charcoal from the inside of the barrels. Uh, and they'll every single barrel will be measured 
Uh, they won't ABV them all. They don't need to at this point. That's already been done by the distiller to some degree. Uh, and they're going to adjust the ABV in the end anyway. But they will measure and ca keep tally of exactly how much liquid arrived because they want to be able to account for all of that back to the distiller. So uh, from those troughs, the, everything gets pumped into a mixing, a blending vat. Uh, and that uh, those vats are big. There's lots to them. Uh, and they will uh, take an ABV overall at that particular point. And then comes the sort of next step. So they've combined all the flavors together. All those barrels that they've just emptied, they put temporary bungs back into them. And then they get shipped back to the cooperage where the barrels will be reconditioned and returned to the distiller. Um, some barrels get junked, but recognize they use the barrel several times. In fact, often a first use barrel they won't use for very long. They'll use it for two or three years and then do another batch into it. So those barrels are, are repurposed very quickly. Um, after a fourth or fifth go on a barrel, it's typically assessed as used up and they'll use that wood for other things. In fact, I have several staves from, um, from the Glenfiddich Distillery that I've uh, done smoking with. Or put a piece of lamb on top of a couple of staves from uh, Maker's Mark and sort of steam bourbon into my meat. <laughs> uh, if you can, if you can get your hands on those, uh, I highly recommend that. <laughs> nice. uh, so now that it's all vatted together, uh, we now go through a series of steps depending on the particular whiskey and what they each uh, distiller will have a recipe for a given bottling. So one of the steps, arguably one of the most controversial ones, is called chill filtration. So here's the problem. Real, if I take that cast strength whiskey, especially say I just bottled that cast strength whiskey and do you put it on a shelf or you put it in the cellar and it gets cold. You take the bottle out and you look at it and the liquid is no longer transparent. In fact, it's gone kind of cloudy. Has it gone bad? And people, people don't like that, especially if you bought an expensive whiskey to have it go kind of cloudy makes they make them sad. And and the lower <laughs> the ABV, the more likely this is to happen. This also will happen in the glass. If you choose to put ice in your whiskey, and there's some whiskeys I would say that too, but look, if you're spending $1,000 on a cast strength whiskey, they don't put ice in it. You were trying to drink it for the flavor. Why right. are you suppressing the right. flavor? Hey, can but, I see a quick question? I'm sorry. Yeah. I, maybe I missed this, but this, this thing comes out at some APV, ABV, which is, yeah. just, ABV, which is just based on, it could be a range. It, yeah, absolutely. It, so at this stage in the process, is there anything you can do about that? Oh, yeah. Well, it, most whiskeys we're going to add water to. Okay. Right? And that doesn't change the flavor too Absolutely much? Absolutely, it will. Okay. But Without a doubt. So, the, I mean, is that part of the calculus of arriving yes. at that desk? Okay. Yeah, that's all That's all part of the calculus. But before we do that, we'll typically chill filter it. Uh, although, oh, okay. sure. I mean, sometimes they'll add water first. It depends. Again, this is very much the recipe. But... You recognize a lot of those casts when you first get that when you first report in, they may still be pushing sixty percent, and that's very strong whiskey. In fact, it's yeah. illegal to sell sixty percent plus alcohol in many countries, like including Norway. Like okay. I happen to know you're a fan of uh, Abalura Bunda, mm -hmm. which is a cast strength whiskey, and so their ABV varies between fifty five and sixty two. And apparently okay. when they got to ship a, bear, a case over to Norway, they pick through it to remove all the 60s because it's illegal <laughs> to import 60% plus oh, into Norway. Okay. Um, and generally you don't want it like that or it, it, can you actually. They're individually labeled. They are. So you, okay. So you can actually look at the bottle and this one's 55, this one's yep. 57. Or, yeah, okay. Wow. Okay. Totally normal. And again, only for those cast strengths do you see that particular yep. problem. Most production whiskey, because most people want the same thing every time. Yep will want the same ABV and it'll typically be, you know, in the forties. Okay. So well. again, the distiller tells them what they want. And, yeah. uh, and the magic number actually is 46. And partly that has to do with this clouding problem because at 40, the higher the alcohol, the less likely it is to cloud. Now what's actually happening when a whiskey clouds, it's called flo flocculation. So there are, there are long chain fatty acids that still exist inside of the whiskey at this point. If you if you heat it, it'll break them. But when it gets cooled, they clump together. They flock, and you and it makes uh, the liquid somewhat translucent. That's all it is. If you let it warmed up a bit, it wouldn't happen. That if the ABVs are higher, it's very unlikely to happen. Which is why typically in a cast strength whiskey, you'll never see any flocking. Hmm. It's just because the alcohol rate said over is in fifty five, fifty seven. That's it's not a problem. But 
you know, your traditional spirit, like if you're talking about a gin or a vodka, they're all 40%, right? That's sort of the mm -hmm. definition of a spirit is 40% alcohol. And if you lower whiskey down to 40%, it will flock unless you chill filter it. So you set the ABV by adding water to it, and it's purified water. It's you know, the kind of water you wouldn't enjoy drinking, but you, know, you really shouldn't put any other kind of water in whiskey, uh, or you're really going to change it. As soon as you add mineralization to, to whiskey at all, you're going to change it substantially. Now, are you changing the flavor of the whiskey? Absolutely. And for two reasons. One is obviously you're diluting it, so the brightness of the alcohol is going to diminish. But also, whatever came out of that barrel had pulled substances from the wood, some of which solved in water, some of which solved in alcohol. And, the, and eventually the solventability of the water gets saturated just like the solventability of the alcohol gets saturated as well. It's been in there for a decade plus. So when you introduce new solvent, new water, it's gonna break some of the esters down. One of the things I, when I'm drinking cast strength, and, and uh, when I, I think I've done this with you, Paul, is we'll pour cast strength straight into a glass. We won't put anything in it, uh, and nor should we, and taste it as it is. And often they're quite potent. And then I'll take a dropper, typically even just a little glass rod. We'll dip it in some clear, some distilled water, you know, very pure water, and put a drop of water into the whiskey. Again, seems terribly pretentious. But for an actual cast strength whiskey, what you'll see as that wad, that droplet falls through the whiskey is the esters breaking apart. You'll see a rolling effect through the whiskey as these long change acids change. And then we'll taste it again. And even with just a drop of water, you'll get a new flavor. And not always better. Hmm. You know, sometimes you want those compounds to break in the mouth rather than break in the glass. Because you're always introducing water when you drink it anyway. So all of that's going to happen as we set a consistent ABV, again, for a consistent flavor profile. So that's already been done in the vat. Now, at 46%, we can probably get away without chill filtering at all. It's just a question of whether we want those compounds or not. But to understand, this is not a chill filtration is not about flavor. It's about aesthetic. It's about the look of the whiskey when you put an ice cube in it. Right. And so whiskey that is sold at lower ABVs, especially like most blended whiskeys, which are sold at 40 percent, they will always chill filter it just to avoid the clouding when you put an ice cube in it. And the filtration process basically involves chilling the whiskey down enough that it flocks and then pumping the whiskey through filters that will pick up those long chains that have now clumped together in the flocculation and they come out clear so that now when they get chilled, they won't actually flock. Are there, are there any cloudy whiskeys? Absolutely. There are plenty of non-chill filtered whiskeys. I feel like I've seen you know. something like this. Yeah. Sure. And, and, and I, and in fact, it had, I told the story of uh, Glenlivet Nadura some time ago with the Shackleton whiskey that they found. Yeah. Because this is all modern stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Clouding whiskey used to be a normal thing. And uh, after the Shackleton was hit, they made Nadura. And one of the things claims to fame is this oh we don't chill filter yeah. our whiskey right right, right. right. and so that one is cloudy yeah but you'll also see on it it says hey you're gonna because it's natural whiskey natural yeah exactly. not that, that means anything uh you're gonna see clouding when you cool it All right and often they'll even say don't cool it because why would you yeah. suppress the flavor of it like the point is to 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 breathe that in to take all those things in and so uh, but it, clouding is, doesn't mean it's defective. I think where it frightens people is when you pull it out of a cooler and it's all clouded up and you wonder if it's gone bad. Right, right. And it's just, once it's in the glass and it, and it was clear going into the glass and now it's not, you may think maybe the glass is dirty, there was something in the ice and so forth, but actually it's this natural flocculation that just, just comes from flavors. Hmm. Uh, so when we're not done yet, so we've set the ABV, we've perhaps filtered it, now comes another very controversial tendency, but it's all in the name of creating a consistent product, which is coloring. So yeah. the age of a whiskey doesn't necessarily dictate its color. The flavor of a whiskey doesn't necessarily dictate its color. And I would, I would show you something like an Ardbeg 10. If you ever take a if you ever get a look at an Ardbeg 10, and it's in a dark bottle, so you can't really see it, but if you pour it into a glass, you'll see it's a very pale straw color. We go, oh, it's only 10 years old, right? But this is Ardbeg. This is one of the most peated whiskeys in the world. This is one of those whiskeys that has like the taste of a forest fire, right? <laughs> it's like, you know what I feel like? I feel like sitting on a, 
I feel like I'm sitting on a big leather chair that's on fire while licking a dirty ashtray. <laughs> Ard bag uh, can, right? Like, yeah. so, hey, uh, sometimes you're in the mood for that. Now compare that to, say, a Dalmore 12. A Dalmore 12 is om- almost opaque. It's such a rich ruby red color. Now, the reason the Dalmore is so dark is that it's finished in Oloroso sherry casks. And that sherry color comes into the, the drink pretty strongly, so you get a really dark color. However, the different wood emits a different amount of color. Even if you've aged it the same amount, even if the flavor profile's right on, the color might not be what the customer is expecting. They want a consistent product. They want it to taste the same. They want it to look the same. And so... There is a color measurement system they use with a thing called a tint o meter that uses the Lovabond Series 52 brown color scale. Maybe you've heard of it. <laughs> now, this was not invented for whiskey. This is actually a system they use for measuring honey colors and other foodstuff colors. And there is a thing called spirit caramel, um, which is supposed to be organoleptically inert and that AKA does not provide a flavor. It's very potent. One drop per liter is enough to change the color of that liter. Uh, purists disagree that it affects the flavor, but it sets to a particular color. You can set it by based on the number of drops to the color you're looking for, or rather your customers are looking for. Um, there's certainly bottles out there we'll see, just like no chill filtration, no color added. So it's a preference thing. But we get back to this is the commercialization of whiskey where we're after consistency. Now, typically a given batch is 30 to 50, 60,000 bottles. So that's going to be several hundred barrels as we talked about before. We've now made the batch, okay? We've done all the treatments to it. It's now essentially ready for bottling. There are a bunch of different styles of bottles. You specify to the bottler which you, what kind of bottle you want. There's very popular common styles of inexpensive bottles that are used all over Scotland for most editions. The bottling machines have a, uh, the bottles are supposed to be sterile going in. It, the normal practice is they have a spray of the whiskey they're going to be bottled with for their final rinse. So a certain amount of the whiskey from the vat is going to be used in a high pressure spray that basically cleans out, gets that final blast in the bottle so that it's, it's clean. Then they go through a filling process. They are corked. They're labeled. And then they have a foil capsule put on, which is the final seal on it. Um, the, sometimes the labeling is a two-step process, depending on the export license being purchased. So this is often a, a taxation point. Uh, if they have a UK export license on it, they pay an additional fee to the government for export. And then they're boxed. Most uh, Many whiskeys are put into uh, separate boxes, uh, into a square box that holds the bottle that then is put into a larger box of 6 or 12. Some have cylindrical boxes that are put into and then put into a framed box. Uh, boxing of whiskey can get very fancy for higher-end whiskey bottles. You'll have wooden boxes lined with velvet with different fittings. Like you spend $1,000 on a bottle of whiskey, they're going to spend 25 bucks on a fancy box for you. Uh, then those boxes are sealed, they're packaged together, they're wrapped, they're stacked in, on pallets and prepared and, and sent off for shipping. You've made a bottling. Most, like I said, most distilleries don't have bottling facilities. It's also important to know, especially in Scotland, that there are major conglomerates, companies like Di, uh, Diageo and, uh, and Suntory and so forth, that own many distilleries. And so they have, tend to have centralized bottling facilities. And we've just talked about sort of traditional bottling of a single malt, right? We talked about McCallum 12, there's many others. But there's also the process of making blended whiskeys. There are a bunch of different kinds of blended whiskeys. Now, there are well known, uh, you know, the main thing that a blended whiskey talks, uh, a blended whiskey is, is typically a, some kind of single malt, maybe more than one, and then a certain amount of grain alcohol attitude or neutral spirit high distillate distilled with a column still so that you get it up in the 80 90 percent range so it has no flavor in it at all and that'll be more than half the bottle so it reduces the price a lot because that grain spirit's very inexpensive to make you're still going to cut to 40 percent abv now you know you know these names things like johnny walker which is owned by diageo um chivas which only makes blended scotch which we'll talk about in a second owned by Pernod. Um, Dewar's, one of my favorites. I love a Dewar's 12. Uh, made, it's owned by Bacardi. And this week's whiskey, uh, the famous grouse. 
Uh, listen, I have a bottle of Famous Grouse all the time. I mean, we've been talking about whiskey for weeks here. I talk about a lot of different whiskeys. People's really not only talk about expensive whiskeys. Um, we all can just decide what a level of expense is for me. I always have a bottle of Famous Grouse. And I usually have a bottle of Dewar's as well. And I'll tell you why. Hmm. Because after the second $100 bottle taste of a $100 whiskey, you could be drinking copier fluid. Like, what difference does it make, right? Drink, Don't yeah. drink expensive <laughs> stuff after you've had a couple of drinks. And Grouse is great. Grouse is pleasant to drink. It's very nice. Now, and you're talking, that's a $20 bottle of whiskey for a 750 mil, 26 uh, fluid ounces in the measurements of the oppressors. Uh, and it's a 40% alcohol. It's about 60% grain alcohol with a combination of both Macallan and Highland Park. Now, why those two whiskeys? Well, it turns out that the Edrington Group owns both Macallan and Highland Park and Famous Grouse. So this is a way, So you, you know, we were talking about that whole blending process, like how the, dis, the, the master distiller goes through and picks barrels. What happens to barrels he doesn't pick? Right. Right? That, some of them don't always get to a flavor profile that you're looking for. Well, this is one way to use them up. Send them off for a blend, to a blender. We'll talk about some other ways that they can be used up as well, but this is one of the ways that they get used up. Now, it's interesting to note that Famous Grouse is labeled as a blended scotch, as is all Chivas is labeled as blended scotch, as opposed to a blended whiskey. Now, this is supposed to be the rules. We're never really sure if everybody's following them, but to be called a scotch, nothing can be, uh, and nothing can be in the bottle that's spent less than three years in a barrel. So supposedly the Edgerton group uses, takes pure grain spirit. I believe it's wheat, but it might be barley. High distillate. They use a column still for it. Because remember that they also make gin and rum and a bunch of other things, which they use the same bottling plants for. And then they throw it into raw virgin casks for three years. Now, they need to do that anyway because those barrels are now in better shape to age whiskey for longer. You rarely want to use virgin oak for more than three years. It imparts too many strong flavors. So they actually age their high distillate spirit so they can call it blended scotch, and then they combine them. They also talk about in their process that they marry the blend at 46. So normally when you're going to marry that blend, when everything goes in the vat, it's at whatever ABV it was in the barrel, Right. But they apparently cut the individual distillates that they're combining in the vat down to 46 before they combine them. And they do this to avoid chill filtration. I don't know that it works because they still ultimately bottle it at 40, but they don't bother with chill filtration, which is the costly step as well. But it's part of what makes Famous Grouse distinctive is to be able to combine those whiskeys together. So while they may marry at 46, they ultimately bottle at 40. So they add more water a little later on in the process. Chivas Regal, owned by Pernod, they only blend single malts together. They use no grain spirit. But again, it's those, it's the extra casks. They combine them in a larger variety of ways. Um, Pernod owns many distilleries, so they have a lot of different barrels to play with. So it doesn't get to be called a single malt. It's not from a given distillery. It doesn't have a year on it because it'll often be young barrels because same thing, they want to use up some of those virgin oak barrels in their first fills. So they'll use that in the blend to get to their flavor profiles. But many of the others are called blended whiskeys because they do have straight spirit in it as well. Mm -hmm. um, they tend, you know, from a taste perspective, the, the neutral spirit's pretty tasteless, but it does have a brightness to it, a sharpness to it. So it, it's really a question of uh, do you get the flavors through? And Highland Park and McAllen are both um, sherry casks, so they have a nice, rich, sweet flavor to them. Makes for a nice whiskey. Uh, I want to point out one very unusual set of bottlings, and this is Diageo. Diageo, the ones who make Johnny Walker. And Diageo not only owns famous brands you've heard of, but they own many distilleries you've never heard of. Like I talked about the Craig Alachi, they're That's a semi-famous. They have a bit of a brand but they're not particularly well-known, but there's ones you've never heard of like Clannish and uh, Linkwood and Tin and Niche. Like they largely don't have a brand, but they do make a lot of whiskey typically for blending. Many of these distilleries don't spend money on marketing. They have relationships with their blenders. And one of those very popular blending places for Diageo is of course, Johnny Walker. 
They make a tremendous amount of whiskey in a lot of different flavors, red, black, blue, green, gold, you name it. They consume all that whiskey. But they do have good master distillers. And the master's distillers go through their barrels, and when they find exceptional ones, they pull them aside for special bottlings they call the flora and fauna bottlings. They don't get export labels, so generally you can only find flora and fauna bottlings in, um, when they started these back in 91, you would only find them in Scotland itself. So I would go up to Scotland to buy flora and fauna bottlings because they were often only 20 pounds, like $30. They're very inexpensive, and some of them were exceptional. They've now become so popular, they started getting export labels and occasionally can find them. They do additional additions. The Mortlock, which is one of the Flora and Fauna set, which again, when, when this started back in the 90s, they had no branding. They were nobody. They were so popular, their prices went through the roof. Last time I saw a Mortlock 16 Flora and Fauna bottling, they wanted 250 bucks for it. And I bought that stuff for $40 back in the day. And now they're actually making branded Mortlock. So it literally drove it to be a brand. Uh, but a variant, all the bottles look the same. It's only the labeling that's different. Like it was a very interesting style that Diageo took to, to do that particular edition. One more thing, just because whiskey's not complicated enough. Now let's talk about independent bottlers. So there are a set of bottlers out there that some have been around for more than 100 years, like Gordon McPhail that do not own a distillery at all, but they have relationships with distilleries and they have opportunities to buy barrels. Sometimes they'll buy barrels and just keep them, get them to a particular age. This is one of Caden Heads, which is another one of these, that although they actually also own a couple of distilleries, they, ho they hold a lot of interesting barrels for a long period of time and then do the bottlings when they think they're ready. So you'll find these in some stores and wonder what the heck they are like, what's Gordon McPhail? They are an independent bottler. They buy barrels from lots of different distilleries. They age them themselves. They finish them their own way. And they'll typically be on the bottle. You don't buy a Gordon and McPhail whiskey. You buy Gordon McPhail's Mortlock 24. That was a set of barrels. The youngest was 20. That's now 24 years old that they decided to do a bottling on. Signatory is another one. Uh, the D Douglas Yang and Hunter Liang, they do uh, independent bottlings. So they are literally buying casks, keeping them for a certain period of time, and making their own additions of whiskey. And it's part of what makes, I think, Mar uh, Scottish whiskey uh, particularly confusing. And one last call on, and that is to the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. So the, this uh, is really a UK thing, although there is a US branch and a Canadian branch in a few other countries. Uh, they buy barrels on behalf of their members and do custom bottlings. They are, as they're quick to say, not a whiskey of the month club. What they are is a club where only members can buy bottles from them and they go looking for bottles as well. So rather than just going to stores to buy Gordon McPhail, you can be part of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society if that works for your country. Um, different deals in different places. It's often hard. Whiskey is one of those things that's difficult to import in small numbers. And so they will uh, push out for there. And that is the story of finishing whiskey. Um, <laughs> that then officially brings us to the end of this episode of Windows Weekly and the end of the explanation of bottling, of, I guess, creating and bottling whiskey. Um, the finishing of whiskey. The fin thank you. The finishing of whiskey. 